I'm a student of neuroscience at the University of Miami. But before I became this, I was an artist and musician. And that hasn't changed. I'm still an artist and musician. Uh, but when people see my artwork, one of the questions I get the most often is, when did I start drawing, or how long ago? And the answer to that question is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, but then again, I don't remember when I first started speaking, or walking, or any of my other major developmental milestones. But what I do remember is that when I found science, or rather when I came to know that I love science, I began to notice a lot of rhetoric surrounding the differences and the contrasts and the opposition, if you will, between art and science. And as a result, growing up with art on my mind proved difficult. I was forced to engage a lot of inquiry from peers and elders about how one meant to make a career out of art. How are you going to make money from it? And you know, needless to say, that was distressing for me. Because how could art be so undervalued in the world when it held such an important purpose in my own life and in that of so many others as well? Did art not serve some fundamental functional purpose in human life? It wasn't until I was about 15 that I began to unlearn some of the things I had been told about art. That was when I heard of a quote that changed the way uh, that I view art and science, not only as separate ideas, but as one. And it was da Vinci who said that there is a science to art and an art to science. Uh, so it was when I came upon this that I really delved into this idea. And there is a strong case, I think, to be made for sight and hearing as the two most important senses for humans. That is, most of what we're capable of is made possible by vision and audition. We experience music because we can hear, and we experience art because we can see. As sensory beings, the whole of our experiences is a holistic summary of what we can perceive. The compression waves that push through the ear and uh, push through the air and into the ear, and the electromagnetic light that shines through the eye. Uh, but it's important to understand that the eye alone does not see, but rather the brain sees. The brain also hears and feels and smells and tastes. It's responsible for taking input from each of the five senses, making you know, sense of them, and uh, you know, experiencing them at all. And so the brain is the most powerful computer on Earth, made of some 100 billion neurons, all of them communicating with each other. Uh, constantly. And there's a parallel that I like to draw between ourselves and ourselves. And that the parallel is this. As we connect to each other, as we communicate and reach out and exchange thoughts and ideas, so too do ourselves communicate and reach out and explain, express thoughts and ideas of their own. And there's a way that we can look at this through the lens of art, and I'll show you. So this piece is kind of famous. You may have seen it once or twice before. Uh, this is the creation of Adam by Michelangelo. And it's up on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, as an artist, you know, I admire this piece uh, for different reasons. The form, the composition, the color, the light and shadow. But as a scientist, two things in particular stand out to me here. And I'll show you what they are. If you look at God and the angels and garments that surround him, you'll notice a peculiar shape, and that's the shape of a human brain. You look at it from the side, uh, this is a sagittal view, um, but you can see the cerebellum here in the back, uh, the frontal cortex in the front, and maybe God's legs make the brain stem. And interestingly, God's hand seems to be emerging from the frontal cortex, which is where scientists now know is the home of conscious thought, uh, excuse me, um, conscious thought, uh, problem solving and imagination. But even more interesting to me than that is this. And it would seem to me, by the position of these hands, their reach to one another, that God is not necessarily creating Adam in this scene, but rather giving him something. Perhaps the gift of intellect, consciousness, being. But they're not touching each other, and that's the part that I found the most fascinating. And so if God is indeed giving something to Adam here, he's doing so by way of synaptic transmission, as neurons do unto one another. So I started to play with this idea my senior year of high school. Uh, so I was 17 when I did this piece. Uh, in an effort to illustrate this idea, 
visually. I called it God form for obvious reasons. And <laughs> um, I, it was part of a series that I titled Neuroverse, which meant to explore the inner workings of the nervous system through visual metaphors. And one thing I actually noticed years after I did this is not just the fact that they're reaching to one another, but the position and the energy in their hands. God's hand seems to be strong and energetic and active, uh, full of energy, while Adam restfully reclines his hand limp and passive. In scientific terms, we would say that God, neuron A, is exhibiting an action potential, while Adam, neuron B, is at resting potential. So where am I going with this? Well, I'll ask you again. Does art, in fact, serve some fundamental functional purpose in human life? Or is it just for enjoyment? And if it does have a special purpose, how can we use that tool to better understand the world around us and even to benefit the practice of medicine? In order to answer these questions, we have to do as Da Vinci might have suggested. We have to expand and merge our seemingly separate schools of thought. We have to study the science of art and the art of science we have to develop our senses and realize that everything is connected to everything else. Everything is connected. So let's move through the eye. So this is another piece that I did as part of that series uh, on vision. And so when light bounces uh, off of objects and meets your eyes, it moves first through the cornea, the transparent layer, and all the way to the back, uh, where it focuses onto the retina. And the retina has special cells in it called photoreceptors that take light energy and transduce it, convert it into an electrical signal that the brain can interpret and understand. But why is this important? Well, I think it's important that we understand how we use the sense of vision. Um, because vision, as we discussed, is one of the most important senses for us in terms of navigating the world. And as a bonus, we get to engage with art um, and intake new visual ideas. Um, I'll give you an example of that. And, and, so, you know, so art can be used functionally in science, and it's not just for beauty and aesthetic. So this is an illustration by the legendary Frank Netter, who really changed the game in medicine with his medical illustrations. Uh, and he, you know, physicians and medical students have long struggled with the challenge of visualizing anatomical systems, and Frank Netter made it all the easier with his beautiful compositions and just a way of illustrating human anatomy accurately and that is aesthetically pleasing. So that's one way that art can be used in the context of science, and that can manifest in different ways. Art, can, art therapy has been shown to help people with neurological disorders, uh, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And interestingly, music has been shown to have this power as well. Music can be used to help people with neurological disorders. But how? How do we use music, and how can we manipulate sound to suit our needs and to meet our goals? And to get there, we have to understand what it means to hear. So the ear doesn't actually look like this, the ear track, but, but this is my composition uh, on the ear. And so when a vibration passes through the air and meets the ear, it travels through the ear canal and strikes the tympanic membrane. You know it as the eardrum. And that creates a vibration inside of the ear, which is translated into the cochlea, and that's that snail-shaped guy there. Um, and he converts sound energy, mechanical energy, into an electrical signal that, again, can be understood by the brain. And once it gets to the brain, it moves to different parts, depending on what kind of information is being processed. Language, for example, is known to live in the left hemisphere of the brain. Um, but music, it, I mean, well, language is not the only product of our ability to replicate and understand sound. For that, we also invented music. And music is processed differently from language. It, it isn't cut and dry like that. It's, music finds its way inexplicably into our emotions and our memories and even into our language processing itself. And that makes it a very useful and valuable tool to treat people with neurological disorders, specifically language and movement disorders. So I'll show you an example of this. Uh, I have a video of my good friend and classmate, Kathleen. She's a student music therapist here at the university. And uh, this is her working with a patient. Um, he suffered an aneurysm that compromised his language processing centers. And so he's trying to regain a little bit of that language. Um, so let's see what happens when we incorporate a sound, a melody, and a rhythm to the equation. Hey, hey. 
Every single day, cause I love my occupation. Close. Occupation. That's a hard word. Occupation. Occupation. Good. Okay. A I'm on vacation. Every single day, cause I love my occupation. That's an amazing word. So that song is called Vacation by Dirty Heads. And to this man, that song is extremely important because he loves it. It's one of his favorite songs. And so you saw what happened here. He said, he said occupation like 15 times while I was there. And he, a familiar melody, a familiar rhythm, familiar lyrics were able to elicit words from him that he had previously been completely unable to say. And that is a testament to the power of music in the brain. So we talked a little bit so far about art and music and how, can they, how they can be applied in science. And technology has a way of integrating these concepts and merging them in new and innovative ways, one of which is virtual reality. And this is one that I found really especially interesting. And virtual reality is now being used as a therapeutic tool as well to treat all kinds of neurological disorders. But almost more interesting is that this technology is not only being used by patients, it's being used by doctors as well. So I recall Frank Netter, uh, who did these beautiful medical illustrations. And there was one limit to them that even at that, at that time, even he could not solve, and that's that it was two-dimensional. But new technology is taking it a step further and helping us to visualize human systems in 3D. So Metamiz has launched a, a special uh, augmented reality program for an apparatus that is helping us to visualize not only pre-drawn, generalized human systems for studying, but also personalized patient data. So what we're seeing here is a 3D rendering of an MRI. And keep in mind, the guy's wearing goggles that are allowing him to see this. He's moving around the image. And he, the whole point of this is to visualize with greater accuracy and precision the size and posi position of a tumor that is being extracted by surgeons. So I don't know about you, but I think this is absolutely incredible and really amazing. And especially exciting for me as an aspiring neurosurgeon because maybe I'll get to use this technology myself someday. Um, so why did I show you all of this? Well, I want you to see clearly that amazing, incredible things are happening in the world of science today. But more than that, what I want you to walk away with is this. Art, music, and technology make themselves a vital, integral, natural part of human life. And in doing so, they are part of the core of what makes us human. And we can use these tools, and we have been using these tools, to better understand ourselves and others, and even to make leaps and bounds in medicine. And we've barely even scratched the surface of what's possible. That's why I started this organization. It's called Neuromission, and it's a nonprofit. And what we're doing, or our mission is to help people with neurological disorders by integrating art, music, and technology. Uh, and we even started a chapter of it here at the University of Miami. And it's all founded and based in these basic principles that to understand the psychophysics of the things that we enjoy, that is the science of art. But to fully immerse ourselves in these ideas and to use them to better understand the world around us, to understand our neighbor, and to help others. That is the art of science. Thank you.